You'll start the recording? Started. Okay. All right. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. My name is Sarah Carr, and I'm coordinator for the Coastal Marine Ecosystem Based Management Tools Network, EBM Tools Network for short. Uh, it is co coordinated by Octo and NatureServe. And I have with me today Ray Evrard, who is co host for this webinar. Uh, and we want to welcome everyone. We're very glad you could be here today. We especially want to welcome our three presenters, Josh Murphy, Nate Harold, and Doug Marcy uh, from the NOAA Office for Coastal Management. We're going to be speaking today about NOAA's Digital Coast, turning coastal data and tools into actionable information. Before we get started, I just wanted to let everyone know how to ask questions. Now we're going to have about 30 minutes of presentation, and then we'll have plenty of time for question and answer at the end. Um, we encourage you to go ahead and send in your questions as you have them, so you don't need to wait till the end. Uh, you can send them in one of two ways. You can put them into the chat, um, uh, or the question and answer answer panel, we'll see it either way. Uh, if you had any comments that you, you wanted just the panelists to see, make sure you're directed to the panelists. Uh, or if you had something you just wanted an organizer to see, you could direct it to Ray or I. Um, but if you had uh, any information you wanted to send to the whole assembled group that is possible through the chat interface, just please keep it on topic. Okay, well, uh, thank you, Josh, Nate, and Doug. I'll turn it over to you now. Great, thank you, uh, Sarah, and good afternoon or good morning, everyone. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today, as Sarah mentioned, about a platform that, that hopefully uh, a lot of you guys are at very least aware of and potentially um, have used in the past. Uh, we call it NOAA's Digital Coast. Let me uh, jump right in here and talk about uh, the lineup for today. Uh, my name is Josh Murphy. Uh, I'm there on the left. I'm with the Office for Coastal Management and our office in Silver Spring, Maryland at NOAA headquarters. Uh, I'm going to spend about 10 minutes just kind of giving you a, an overview of, of what the Digital Coast is all about and some of our major thematic areas. But we know that you guys are, are all here about uh, some of the tools uh, that we uh, provide uh, and provide through the EBM Tools Network. So we've got Nate Harold and Doug Marcy from our Charleston office who are going to talk about the uh, Coastal Change Analysis Program and Land Cover Atlas and some of the land cover data um, efforts in our sea level rise viewer, uh, respectively. So um, without further ado, so again, uh, hopefully a lot of you guys are familiar with uh, this notion of the digital coast. We've been around now uh, a little more than, than 10 years. We just recently celebrated our 10 year anniversary. Um, you see here kind of our, our approach really is, is, is this recognition that, um, you know, we, we in our office, the Office for Coastal Management, we, we have a very broad spatial reach. Uh, we work with coastal managers uh, and coastal management professionals uh, on all the U, uh, U.S. major uh, coasts, Atlantic, Pacific, Gulf Coast, uh, Great Lakes, as well as our Caribbean and Pacific territories. And, you know, really what that means is, is that there's, there's a lot of different diversity in the way in which coastal communities um, address issues and the issues that they face. And, and we recognize that there's a real um, opportunity here to, to leverage place-based uh, information, geospatial information. So really what we, what we really hope to do at the Digital Coast is to bring the geospatial uh, and coastal management communities together. And our outcome here, um, what we hope that we are achieving through this Digital Coast is a constituent-driven, integrated enabling platform supporting coastal resource management that is used. Now, that's a, that, that's a lot to, to kind of unpack. So I'm going to kind of maybe talk a little bit here about what really that means. When we talk about being an, an enabling platform, it's important to note that um, the Digital Coast website that a lot of you are probably familiar with is our, our front door, if you will. And, and certainly that's what we're primarily known for. But it is really supported by what you see here uh, in this schematic on the right. That is the Digital Coast Partnership. A lot of folks don't recognize that when we started the Digital Coast over 10 years ago, we didn't start with the website, we started with the partnership. And it's this relationship between the partnership, and I'll talk about the organizations that comprise the partnership in just a second, and the website that, that really is, is how we, we intend this and, and how we really can say that we are an enabling platform because at the end of the day, we don't just want to provide information. We want to provide information in such a way that it's used and applied to address coastal management issues. So we talk about the partnership here. You see, um, it all starts with, with us here at the NOAA Office for Coastal Management, uh, but we have eight national level organizations that either represent folks that are, are supporting coastal management and coastal stewardship at a variety of different scales, or they're organizations with members and staff that 
provide a really great subject matter expertise and perspective on some of the issues that we know are important to coastal management uh, broadly across the country. Some of these organizations you've probably heard of and are very familiar with, like the American Planning Association, maybe the Nature Conservancy. Some of these, uh, like the National States Geographic Information Council, you may not be as familiar with. Uh, NISGIC, as we like to refer to them, to them uh, represents a lot of the, the state's level uh, geographic information officers. Those are the real uh, technical folks uh, that really work, uh, use and apply and, and are on the, the cutting edge of geospatial information. Other groups like the Association of State Floodplain Managers provide great expertise in, in uh, dealing with, with coastal hazards and, and flood related issues. So the partnership really helps us at NOAA really better understand how different organizations and, and members within those organizations use and apply uh, data and information. It's important to note that uh, if you if you took a look at the audience of the digital coast, there's not one way specifically in which we can characterize um, how how you know our audience broadly uses information. We have folks that are very very technical uh, that have the resources and the capabilities to be able to use, uh, say for instance, raw lidar data and derive great information from that. But we also have a lot of folks. That, um, that don't have the, the access to those uh, resources. Maybe they don't have uh, the necessary staff, but they, they, they certainly are facing coastal issues. And they, they certainly recognize the value that place-based information can really provide to them. And so we've developed this Digital Coast platform uh, to really provide a, a broad spectrum approach to information uh, that can be used not only by folks who have a, a great uh, you know, advanced technical background, but also some of those folks that may be closer to the actual decision making. You see this slide here really shows you kind of, and, and I think that what we're going to talk about today in the areas of coastal land cover and sea level rise really are some of the best examples of how we demonstrate how we provide multiple avenues to getting to information and we do it in such a way that we facilitate linkages. Again, we, we talked about the digital coast not only just being an enabling platform, but being an integrated enabling platform. That means that you could come in, you can learn about information, you can download it, uh, the, the raw data in many instances, you can see what that information looks like on a map. You can um, dig a little bit deeper into the information itself and analyze it. Learning, uh, we, we, we recognize very much that uh, you know we don't just want to put information out the door. We want to teach folks how to be able to derive their own information using their own data or share it with others. And certainly, um, we know uh, through conversations with a lot of our users that they they love to hear from us, but they they love even more to hear from what their uh, their partners in coastal management across the country are doing. And so we want this to be a platform to help folks share information. So real quickly here, I'm going to run through kind of some of the major sections of the Digital Coast uh, web platform uh, that you may already be familiar with. And then again, I'm going to hand things over. Uh, to my colleagues Nate and then Doug down in Charleston who are going to do a deep dive into a couple of specific tools. But, you know, we like to say at, in the Digital Coast, if you look at our website, it says more than just data. And that's not to diminish the role that data plays in the Digital Coast platform. It really is the foundation upon which uh, we really um, derive a lot of great uh, kind of supporting products. We, we've got a huge repository uh, of coastal uh, uh, elevation data, uh, high resolution elevation data derived from LIDAR that comes from, from NOAA, some of our federal partners and USGS, the Army Corps, and state and local partners as well. Nate is going to talk a little bit more about our land cover data products that we have. We also have ortho imagery. All of that comes from a custom developed data access viewer application that allows you to come in and, and get to uh, you know get the data for the exact area that you need and in a format as appropriate for the resources that you have. We, we've also uh, made major strides in the last three to five years in, in putting our data out the door, not just through direct download, but also through uh, web services as well. And, and we'd like to, you know, we, we don't just have the data that we host within the digital coast. We like to curate and facilitate linkages to a lot of uh, supporting national level coastal data sets uh, that are developed uh, through some of our federal partners. Again, uh, Nate and Doug are going to talk about two of our specific tools that we have. We have um, well over uh, 50 tools. I think the number is actually approaching 60 right now. And you know, thanks again to the advances in, in GIS uh, over the last several years and the fact that now a lot of uh, GIS is done on the web, it means that, that we can develop and put out tools that, that don't require the use of desktop 
mapping software like ArcGIS for desktop or ArcGIS Pro uh, or QGIS, uh, whatever you, you use, but really um, we can put things out the door that only require an internet uh, connection uh, in a web browser, which again helps us expand the reach of some of the great information, coastal information resources that we have. And so again, uh, Nate and Doug are going to talk about uh, two uh, of the products that we have as in a part of our tools portfolio. But again, you know, we, we have a very heavy emphasis, and, and this is a certainly more recent, uh, on, on training and, and really trying to, to recognize that a lot of our users, um, they appreciate some of the, the great training that we do that's instructor-led, that's you know, classroom-based. But, you know, a lot of folks now, the, the whole paradigm of, of training is shifting now to learning. And and providing different uh, resources that facilitate uh, learning uh, on one's own time. And so you see here, we've got almost 200 different uh, learning resources now and a part of our website we, we refer to as Digital Coast Academy. If you haven't been in about the last year or so, uh, you're in for a real treat. We've got all kinds of different uh, learning resources. You see here the different categories. Uh, I, my, one of my favorite areas now is the new case studies uh, that we have that, that I think just do a really effective job of kind of, you know, really helping someone understand uh, how folks are approaching coastal issues. What's the information they're using? What are the partnerships that, that they've built to be able to do that? And so um, you see here, we, we've got uh, uh, how this all kind of comes together. We've still got some of our great instructor led training, like adaptation planning for coastal communities. Um, but we've also got things like quick references and publications that um, certainly affect learning, but, but may not be the traditional way in which folks are used to learning in a, in a classroom setting. So we've got a lot to offer through the Digital Coast Academy. And finally, uh, I'll, I'll close by talking about what we feel is one of the more valuable parts of the Digital Coast platform. And it's called Stories from the Field. Again, you know, we, we really want folks to be able to use and apply the, the Digital Coast information resources to address coastal issues. And again, there's, there's a, a lot of uh, great uh, parts of our nation's coastline that makes uh, the individual coastal communities unique. And so we really try to capture that uh, through this notion of this, this part of the website that we call Stories from the Field that allows us to really capture these short, uh, explicit, to the point vignettes that our partners, our users, work uh, with us collaboratively to uh, really to demonstrate how the digital coast is being used, to really help uh, answer that question that a lot of our users have of, this is great information, how is it being used? Well. These stories uh, allow us to uh, allow our users to help us tell the story of how the digital coast is being used. So I certainly invite, if you are new to the digital coast platform, to to certainly take a look at what we're doing, what our what our users uh, and our constituents are doing out in the coastal zone. So um, that's just a, a a very kind of very brief digital coast 101 for those of you maybe uh, maybe you aren't familiar with the digital coast or maybe you've used it in the past. Uh, one of the things being a constituent driven platform, we, we are constantly making changes to ensure that folks can get to the information resources that they need and that we have information that's timely and relevant. One of the ways in which we do that is by encouraging folks to, to talk to us, provide us with feedback. And so you see here, I'll, I'll close before I hand it over to Nate by pointing out uh, the URL to our website there. And then those are the different ways in which uh, you can contact us, certainly via the email address there, coastal.info at noaa.gov. But we're also on social media through Facebook uh, and Twitter. We invite you to follow along with us. And again, if there's uh, anything that we can do to, to build the digital coast in such a way that it, it, it provides uh, additional detail or really uh, meets the needs of your community, uh, your constituency, we're uh, all ears for that. So uh, I will uh, transition now over to my colleague, Nate Harold, uh, who's in our Charleston office, who leads our land cover mapping uh, efforts. So Nate, uh, I will hand things over to you. All right, thanks, Josh. I'll go ahead and share my screen. Make sure I share the correct one. And as Josh mentioned, I'm just gonna dive a little bit deeper into one of our tools, um, our Land Cover Atlas. So this is the, the tools page of the Digital Coast website. Um, you can see that it's got a listing of, of all the available tools within it. Um, not just NOAA tools, but tools that we have found to be relevant for coastal issues and to our customer base. There's a few tools for searching uh, by keyword or moving through filters in order to find tools. Uh, the CCAP Land Cover Atlas has the advantage of uh, coming very high in the alphabet, so it's right here at the top. We didn't have to name it the A number one 
land cover tool or anything. Uh, a few of the things that I like to point out for folks who come to the website is that you of course can, can launch the tool. Uh, there's typically other direct downloads for tools where we also serve up the data, like in the case of the Coastal Change Analysis Program. There's a very direct link to that data. And we try to make a lot of connections between the tools and the data sets to other things within the website. So you can see other related tools, uh, stories where this tool or some of the data has been used and you can see how, uh, data that's included within the tool, and some of the related trainings that are available that um, might help you make better use of that tool. Now I'm gonna go ahead and jump right into the tool itself. Uh, this is what you get when you come into the tool. Uh, as Josh mentioned, this is a tool that was built around our coastal change analysis program. This is a land cover data set that we've been developing within NOAA for a number of decades now. And essentially, we map all the areas that you can see here uh, in the CONUS, uh, the contiguous US. Uh, so all, all of these areas are what we consider coastal for our land cover mapping, as well as all of the islands in the Pacific and the Caribbean. Um, this is actually a tool that we built in a, as a way to address one of our most common technical assistance requests, which was for folks who wanted to obtain some custom summarized information for their area of interest based on our land cover data. And so we found it easier to build a tool that could do that for anyone and everyone who wanted to come in and, and see some of this information than it was to in respond to e every individual request that we received. And so um, I'll just go ahead and dive right into the tool. You can come in, you can pick your county, uh, state and county of interest. In this case, I'm choosing Horry County, South Carolina. Uh, it's one that's not too far away from me and that I'm pretty familiar with in terms of the change that's going on there. And it also just happens to be because um, this is the site where we have uh, our Coastal GeoTools conference every other year. So um, those of you who may be interested or have attended that in the past, you may be familiar with some of this area, or if you happen to come to the Myrtle Beach area on vacation, it's, it's an area you might be familiar with. And so one once you get in, into the tool, you can see the outline of the county here, and you're presented with uh, a lot of information, actually. Uh, we like to think that it's in an easy to parse way, but it starts off with just how much of that county has changed. Uh, and in this case, we're looking at a time frame from 1996 to 2010. Uh, that's about the longest time frame that we have for this county. Uh, you could change that to be shorter. I like to stick with the longer time frame. It, it, it provides a little bit more to look at. So we can see almost 19% of the county changed uh, over that roughly 15 year time period. You can see all the areas within the county that did change highlighted in red. If you wanted to see what the land cover call associated with those areas were, you can turn on that land cover. You can turn down the opacity of that change information and uh, kind of move back and forth between the two. We'll focus just in on the, the mapping layers. In addition to just knowing how much of the county and where the county changed, you get to see what the distribution of all of our various land cover types were for each of those two time periods. And kind of by looking at those, you can see the net difference between them, uh, between the two time periods. So you can see a, an increase in shrub here, a decrease in woody wetland down here. Um, and then you can kind of scroll through some of the other information in the tool and dive a little bit deeper into those. So here's a, a distribution of only the changes. So instead of just the total area per class, we can see how much area was lost and how much area was gained so that there's both of those changes occurring at the same time that results in that net change that we saw earlier. And then there's also a table that, that lists all of this out for you so you can see how much area there was to begin with, how much area in that land cover category was lost, how much offsetting gains there would be, and what the net result was in 2010. In addition to just looking at total change, uh, you can dive and look a little bit deeper at specific types of change. And so what I've done here is clicked over into the development tab of the tool. And so I've isolated only those changes associated with development. Um, in this case, we're looking at new areas of development in green, 
and areas where develop, developed areas were lost in red. You can understand that's a pretty rare occurrence in most locations, so you're not seeing a lot of that here. Um, you can look and see how much of the county was developed in each of the two time periods, as well as how much of the county was covered by impervious surfaces in each of those two time periods. And then you can see kind of a net increase related to how much development there was in 1996. So this was a, a pretty big, pretty big increase in the amount of development for the county. Uh, and you can see exactly where those developed features came from. So in this case, it was formerly forested and woody wetland areas. Similar to development, you can see trends for forest cover. And again, we're keeping with that same um, color scheme of areas that were added into forest and areas that were lost. You can see we're dealing with a little bit more losses in this county than we are gains. And you can see the same information for wetlands. And, <clears throat> and it's the same, same legend as we were looking at before. You can see the types of wetlands that were lost. In this case, it's primarily losses in palustrian forests. And you've got some gains in shrub, shrub wetlands as well as emergent wetlands. And then for the areas that were wetland losses, you can see exactly what those wetland losses to, maybe not surprisingly, since we were looking at the development tab a little bit earlier on, uh, you can see that a lot of those losses had to do with, with development going on in the area. In addition to digging into this, this data uh, and the information that you can pull out of the data, uh, we have a couple of helpful little widgets up here at the top. One is to obtain a report of this information. And what that presents you with is a PDF that just kind of summarizes what we saw in each of those tabs of the tool. So this is the, the general change information, uh, the change associated with development and so on. But it gives you something nice that you can print and walk away with. In addition to that, we have a link generator. If you zoom down in on a certain feature and you wanted to send that along to somebody else to see what was going on, you could generate your own custom links as well as links to download, download the data directly. And I think with that, I've probably used up my time and I'll hand it over to Doug to walk you through the Sea Level Rise Viewer. Okay, great. Thank you, Nate. Um, I'm going to try to share my screen now. Um, you have to stop yours first. Or I, I think no, you I should just be able it. to grab it no. away from me. Yeah, you should right. just be able to grab it. Okay, I've got... Oh. There, we got it. I see yes, it. Yep, yep. Okay, yep, see great. Rise All right, I'm just starting at the Sea Level Rise Viewer uh, tools page. As uh, Josh and um, Nate showed you, you can get to these through the tools. There's a ton of tools in there, and the Sea Level Rise Viewer is one. Matter of fact, it's highlighted on the main page as one of our more popular tools. Um, the viewer was really developed uh, in stages starting um, back around 2011, 2012, starting on the Gulf Coast and then uh, mapping all of the Gulf Coast states except for Louisiana, then the West Coast, and we kind of went around the country, including the islands. Uh, so now it's available uh, everywhere in the U.S., including the territories, um, excluding Alaska, which we may be doing some work there next year or two. Um, and um, we uh, continue to update that, and I'll talk a little bit about that. So this is the home page for the Sea Level Rise Viewer, and just like uh, Nate showed you, just want to point out a couple things. If if you're interested in just the data, uh, and you don't even want to go into the viewer, you can go right here to the download data button. This goes to uh, based on your state. You can go in here, and you can pick uh, the the layers that are in the viewer that I'll be showing you. You can download those. Uh, you can also download the uh, elevation data, the DEMs, uh, that the mapping is actually based on. Uh, and close that. Um, you can also, if you want to pull in the map services, um, you, if you're a GIS person, you can uh, grab these map services, pull them into your own viewer. Uh, we have a lot of different uh, applications out there that actually use our, our map services, like TNCs, Coastal Resilience Tool, and others. Um, we have a video, quick video about the tool. We have a couple other videos on here and a tutorial um, 
I'll mention that in a minute about um, some of our new additions in terms of the local sea level rise scenarios. Uh, you can grab the uh, FAQ um, and then all of the methods for how we do the mapping for each of the of the tabs in the viewer I'll show you are available here too. And just like Nate mentioned at the bottom, uh, you can see related data. We have over 29 stories from the field of folks who have used the viewer or the data to answer management questions. And we have trainings, for instance, our coastal inundation mapping training is on here that really describes or, or, or teaches folks how to, how to do some of the mapping that we do to uh, when we do the viewer. Um, I'll go right into it and launch. If you hit the launch button, you can skip all that and go right into the, to the tool. We have a splash page here. Um, if you want, you can click through the different, uh, different parts of the tool that, uh, that you will see when you, when you hit the get started button. We have sea level rise. There's local scenarios. Uh, we just added that in uh, 2017. Mapping confidence, marsh migration, uh, vulnerability, and then flood frequency. Just want to also point out that we do have uh, a page here that shows the data updates. We're a little bit behind on on updating this. Um, we've actually made several updates this year, uh, but this kind of lets you know that we are constantly going in and, and revising and adding new elevation data and, and redoing the mapping. Okay, if you hit the get started button, uh, it comes into the viewer and um, based on where you are, you, it, we've added an, a new uh, feature here just to type in your address. So I'll put, uh, put Charleston, South Carolina, since we're sticking with the South Carolina theme here today. Um, it zooms in to the region. So you're looking at the downtown peninsula. Charleston is located right here and you'll notice you have a couple of these icons. Um, the way this tool works is starts out with uh, the mapping at uh, what we call MHW, which is mean current mean higher high water. That's kind of the average high tides we experience. So anything above that, when you start to get one or two foot, one and a half foot above that, you start to see uh, inundation that starts to cause impacts uh, in many places, especially low lying areas like the southeast. Um, so what you do is you can turn on. Um, the uh, slider here and slide upwards up to six feet. We're actually in the process of adding new mapping to the viewer. We'll be mapping up to 10 feet to match some of the newer, more extreme sea level rise scenarios. So look for that in the next couple months or month or so, we're gonna be adding up to 10 feet. You can click on one of these photo locations here and see um, some familiar landmarks in areas. For instance, this is the US Customs House and you can see how the water will come out um, and how that's going to impact that that location kind of gives you an on the ground feeling of what's going to be impacted. So we know the elevation there using um, our digital elevation model and we can estimate what uh, how much water will uh, be at each individual structure there um, or where we have photos. Um, you can change the mapping units to meters um, if you're so inclined and um, then you can kind of zoom in, pan around, and see what the impacts are. So you can see, for instance, here in Charleston, I'll zoom in. We start to see we have kind of impacts. This is the, the battery area, if you've ever visited. At one foot, everything seems to be okay, and there's a kind of a threshold between two and three feet where you start to have significant inundation. Um, so it can be used for that. And I, the reason I bring that up is when we talk about when when will this happen based on different scenarios? I'll show you that in a second. So if we click on local scenarios, um, first thing that comes up is uh, this kind of tells you what to do. You can zoom to your area of interest. Uh, you have to click on a scenario location and then it's gonna give you five different scenarios. There's also a tutorial you can click on. It leads you through this aspect of the tool. We just added that. So right here you can see there's a, um, an icon, I can click on that, and that actually chooses the Charleston Tide Gauge. It says right here, Charleston, South Carolina. Um, and it brings up this kind of dual slider bar here. So depending on the sea level rise scenario, we want to uh, select, let's just say, an intermediate scenario. You can see that if we go with different scenarios, it changes uh, the, the amount of, of inundation we will see and the date. So if we want to look at the intermediate scenario, um, then we can, you can see the dates here, then you can kind of play with the inundation levels to see, okay, this is around 2080 at 2.89 feet, right around three feet. This is what we might expect 
under the intermediate scenario. You can click on the button down here on the I, and this gives you information about where we're getting these scenarios from. Um, this is actually from the 2017 NOAA a technical report, and that's the same sea level rise, uh, regional sea level rise scenarios that went into the, uh, that are going into the new national climate assessment, the NCA-4. Uh, so it's actually an updated scenarios from NCA-3, which was a, um, which a lot of folks called NOAA scenarios, but those were the previous Parasat Al scenarios. These are the new NOAA tech report scenarios we have in here now. Also, you can view by year. So for instance, looking at this threshold analysis we we're just talking about, so if you want to know okay, between one and two feet, let's say two and three feet, we start to really have problems. When are we gonna see that kind of flooding? Okay, so if we see uh, by 2040, um, we're not gonna really have any impacts, but when it's been permanent inundation, it's gonna be at three feet. You can see that under the, let's say by 2050 at the extreme, we'll start to be over three feet. And by 2060, even the intermediate high is approaching three feet. And so you can use this in two different ways. You can use it by trying to determine the time uh, that things will occur and then the amount uh, of inundation based on the level. Um, we have the same, some of the same functionality we have in a previous uh, version of the viewer. One is the mapping confidence and that really just tells you uh, what the uncertainty is in terms of the um, elevation data we are using and the, uh, the tidal modeling, which is we're using the mean high, high water surface from the NOAA V-data model that we extrapolate over land. And so you can see for very low-lying areas, um, uh, until you get up against the slope, you have these areas of uncertainty in orange. Um, and so what that's telling you is in, even in one-foot increments, there is such plus or minus, you know, one to two feet, depending on the elevation data being used. Um, so that kind of tells you that even though on this tab we're showing you that is wet or dry, there is definitely some uncertainty there um, not just in, um, obviously not, there's uncertainty in the sea level rise scenarios, but this is just the mapping itself with the elevation data. And it tries to convey that. If you go to marsh migration, we also have a time component there. Um, and we click on that and what we see, takes a minute to load these in, these are a little bit large files. So the data that uh, Nate was just telling you about, uh, the CCAP data, we actually use that it's the 30 meter data here in Charleston um, to show you uh, what the potential land cover change might be as sea level rises. So this has the same tool, uh, same slider, but in this case you can actually choose the accretion rate. Uh, so this is based on the amount of sedimentation that will uh, be deposited on the marsh and it's kind of based on some averages. So four millimeters a year, if you select a mid accretion rate, that's going to change you know, whether the marsh will be able to keep up with different scenarios. And again, you can choose by scenario or year. So let's just do an intermediate high. And that sets the years for you. And then you can take the slider and match. So if you want to know at 2080 what the, mar the state of the marsh might look like based on that four millimeter uh, of recretion, then you can look right here and see that we've actually changed uh, some of those areas. And I can pull up the legend we have 16 different land cover classes. So you can see that these the wetland areas and the brackish marsh areas are what are in that sort of magenta color and they kind of transition over because they can't keep up at some level to, uh, to open, open water or this sort of uh, teal color, which is um, unconsolidated shoreline. So it definitely changes the, the land cover type. And that's based on some rule sets that are very similar to the, um, to the uh, SLAM model. One of the last uh, couple of tabs here, we tried to show vulnerability as well. Um, this isn't doing any kind of analysis, but we do overlay the, give you the ability to overlay the inundation on top of uh, what's called a social vulnerability index data that is coming from the University of South Carolina. This is a census tract level. And if you look at the, uh, at the, um, the legend here, we're showing high, medium, and low. Uh, impacts. Uh, I'm sorry, high, medium, low social vulnerability. So this shows you the, the red, dark red areas that have higher social vulnerability. That's based on about 30 or 31 different uh, census variables. It's things like literacy rates, uh, poverty, elderly, all that kind of stuff, which, which makes them uh, more vulnerable. Oops, I hit the wrong button. Sorry about that. Um, then uh, the last tab is high tide flooding. I actually changed the, the uh, terminology there to um, 
it used to be called flood frequency, but we're trying to talk, you know, instead of like nuisance flooding, we're kind of going with this terminology, high tide flooding. And if you click on the icon here, uh, what it does is it brings up uh, a table that shows you, well, currently we're starting to flood this, this red area, which is really a threshold that the weather service, uh, local weather service uh, forecast office uses. Uh, and we map that threshold and it shows you that currently we had 25 times a year over the past five years, we look at the data. And if we increase sea level rise uh, by half a meter, we could see that type of flooding, that red area 455 times, and then for a meter, 700 times. So you're really gonna see an increase in the amount of, of the high tide flooding. Now we're gonna be working with our sister agency, uh, sister office within uh, NOAA co-ops, the tide and water level folks to actually bring in some of their the data so we report on this consistently. So this graph may change when we add the 10 feet to show the inundation history going back way more than five years to show you how these high tide flood events have increased. They've also changed the way they're reporting uh, the, uh, the thresholds and to a more nationally consistent threshold analysis and we're gonna make sure we're uh, consistent with that and we're gonna be linking to their inundation dashboard um, so that we'll have consistent products coming from, from different offices. And again, any of these uh, tabs, you can click on the information button and, and find out more about it and, and read about it as well. Um, one last thing I'll mention, as you notice these, uh, going back to this, I get a lot of questions. The green areas, uh, we leave them in, they're not connected um, by using the DEM, by the hydroconnectivity, but we leave them in because they do start to show these areas when they're not connected that are low lying areas that may start to have ponding water when we have these significant rain events like we've been having the past week here. Uh, these are areas that are gonna flood uh, and also areas where the storm drain, storm water system is gonna start backing up when we have these six high tide events. Um, in here, you can go right in and, and, and view down, you can go to download, there's uh, transparency options. Uh, if you wanna overlay, you can do some screenshots and then this button here lets you share what you're looking at um, take this little mini URL and you can copy and paste that and give that to somebody and they'll be able to see the exact same thing. Uh, one last thing is we have an about, uh, all the information you want, you can access inside the viewer as well with some additional resources, including some of the publications that a lot of this, the scenarios and, and, uh, and some of the science behind this is, is based on. So uh, with that, I will, uh, I will stop and uh, I guess kick it back over to uh, you, Sarah, and we're, um, maybe do questions. Okay, fantastic. Thank you, Doug. And thank you, Nate and Josh. Um, Nate has been very busy answering a lot of the CCAP questions uh, by uh, text. So we'll probably concentrate a lot of the questions uh, for you, Doug, on the sea level rise viewer. Okay. Um, one big picture thing that did come up that I'll, I'll just, oh, wait, it's disappeared, so I don't, so I might've gotten answered. Um, all right, well, let's just, let's dive into some of the um, sea level rise viewer. Um, there was a question, um, let's see, what is the oldest year of the LIDAR data used for the map? The oldest, uh, it's, a, it's a good question. It's, a, it's kind of a patchwork, <laughs> if you can imagine. So when we went around the country starting to map it, we went with the best available. Uh, but it did have to meet certain criteria. At least we, at the beginning, we used FEMA, uh, kind of criteria. Now we're we're trying to use QL2, which is a USGS spec quality level two lighter, which is around, and it pretty much gives you one foot contours. Um, and with that new data, we every place we map now, we're actually mapping at a three meter resolution. But uh, there are data sets in there that are still older. I think some of our oldest data sets are are in maybe South Texas. And uh, we're waiting on some updates. Uh, USGS has been doing a lot of collections there. Um, places where the data wasn't as good, we actually initially did a 10 meter resolution DEM. We're trying to phase all of those out with the new data that comes in and Texas is probably the state that has some of the worst and the oldest data in there. Um, but again, and when new data gets collected, a lot of times after disasters, um, there's supplemental funding, for instance, after Harvey in Texas to collect new data. When we get our hands on that, we will update the mapping and do it at a higher resolution. Okay, great. All, and just to add to that, all of the DEMs, if you want to download those, uh, there's a, a metadata file in there that tells you the vintage of what data went into the DEM. Okay, great. And I think you answered another question probably in that 
Um, okay, that response. Um, some of these questions are beyond my technical level. Um, I can ask. I, I don't know. Yeah, what, do you want to go through them? Um, yeah, I, I, the one about do our do we integrate DFIRM layers? Yes. Um, no, the answer to that is no, we don't. Um, uh, part of that is uh, we're not really trying to capture the like extreme uh, events, um, river flooding or, or storm surge in our bureau. We're really trying to look at just the um, you know sea level rise impacts. I mean, you can use the viewer to see coastal flooding. Obviously, um, if if you see coastal flooding predicted to be a certain level, you can go into the viewer and it's fairly accurate at that at one point. Um, Maybe not regionally, but at, at one location, it would be accurate. But we're not—we try not to confuse the issue with a extreme water level. So, plus FEMA has their DFIRMs changing all the time, and we, we can't um, keep them updated. But there's great examples of other states like New Jersey, where we've given them our their our source code, and they have uh, pulled in our layers, and then they can put their own DFIRMs. They they have the FEMA layers in there, then and, and their own data. So that's another option. That's the beauty of pulling in our map services is you can overlay those on top of uh, the national flood hazard layer that that FEMA maintains. Um, okay, great. I don't know if you want me to keep going. Or? Sure, just keep going. <laughs> You're doing okay. a great job. Um, for Eastern Great Lakes, we actually have another tool I didn't talk about today, but it's if you Google Lake Level Viewer, or NOAA Lake Level Viewer, uh, we have an equivalent viewer for the Great Lakes, uh, only the U.S. side, though, not on the Canada side. And that is actually using uh, topography and bathymetry because we're mapping six feet above the long-term lake level average and six feet below because the lakes go up and down. So uh, it's just coast.noaa.gov slash LLV, lake level viewer, and you can access that. Will a PDF be made of this presentation? That's for you, I think. <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> Tracy, we, uh, well, this is for everyone. There will be a recording of this presentation available on openchannels.org under webinars um, short, within a few hours of the presentation. Uh, as for the PDF, um, if you guys want to provide it, we can post that with it uh, alongside the recording, or people can get in touch with you to see if it's available. How would you prefer to handle that? Would you prefer to have it posted alongside the recording or just answer or respond to emails with requests for it? Um, I think we can we can post it uh, along with uh, the okay. recording okay. if that's easier. In that case, all right, we'll handle that then. Tracy, in that case, uh, check for um, sometime in the next day or so. Uh, they'll, they should be up on uh, openchannels.org under uh is it webinars or recordings what's the it, tab right it's webinars webinars okay all right back to you doug okay um hugo is asking have you identified priority areas where inundation will happen for sure due to low elevation storm surge high tide flooding and and nothing can be done to stop it um so we don't necessarily do any kind of prioritization. Um, we're just basically mapping, we're starting at mean high, high water, and again, we're using that, that tidal model that, that NOAA uses. Because um, mean high, high water, you know, the tide range varies around the country. So um, some places have much bigger tidal range. So we want to take that into account. Um, so we're just identifying areas that, you know, if it flooded today, um, if, if all of a sudden sea level went up X number of feet, this is what would be underwater. Of course, we uh, there's all kinds of caveats with that. You know, we know we're not going to let that happen. There's going to be engineering structures we're going to probably build, and there's the, the barrier islands are going to respond a certain way. We don't, there's not geomorphologic modeling that goes into this. Um, it's really trying to kind of just identify the potential vulnerable spots, and it can be used again, approximate inundation for for an event that's happening, uh, you know, real time type event too. So. Um, and the idea here is to, to um, start to figure out these areas and then because they're in, in GIS layers and, and map services, they can be overlaid and start to do a vulnerability analysis. So when you ask, can anything be done about it? Well, and for example, here in Charleston, they would take this information and start to do a vulnerability analysis. What is going to be impacted at certain levels? Uh, what's, the, what's the dollar amount that that is? And then figure out you know, cost benefit for doing engineering solutions and maybe even like for, for uh, green infrastructure type solutions as well. 
Um, let's see. The sea level revised viewer tab identify what the numbers mean uh, and what they correlate to. In other words, mean tide level. Yeah, there's information in there. If you if you look at the information tab, uh, we describe that. Um, and if you want to, you can Google uh, mean high high water. There's actually a definition. It's actually a tidal datum that is used. Um, so you can you can Google that and get the definition. So the information's in there, and I think if you go into the FAQ, you'll find the answer to that. Um, how are you collaborating with other federal agencies to help them use Digital Coast for implement? That's the Josh question. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Doug. Um, well, I can certainly speak to uh, a, a couple of relevant examples, including a few from the sea level rise viewer. But um, you know, as I mentioned before, uh, a lot of the the data that we uh, you know, that we host uh, and provide, especially the elevation data, uh, is collected uh, not only by NOAA, but with our federal agency partners, the Army Corps of Engineers, USGS, uh, predominantly. Uh, so we certainly work with them and even other parts of, of NOAA, the National Geodetic Survey, for example, to, they, they, are, they leverage the digital coast uh, and the data access for your application we have specifically to, uh, to, to more efficiently uh, put their data out the door uh, to, and get, bring it to users than, than if they would have uh, created their own data access mechanism. Um, we, we also, so that's kind of how we're working with some of our federal agency partners to help build the digital coast platform, but in terms of using it, uh, you know, Doug, I think, you know, I certainly uh, remember and recall some of the great examples we have of organizations that are using our uh, sea level rise data uh, and the digital elevation models we use to develop that. Uh, the Department of Energy uh, specifically used our sea level rise data to do a vulnerability assessment. Doug was just talking about, you know, uh, that Charleston would do something like that. The Department of Energy uh, did that down uh, in the in, in the South, uh, South Florida uh, coast and a couple of other coastal areas as well. Uh, and then I know uh, the Department of Defense uh, has has used our, our data, the Department of the Navy uh, as well. And, and so I certainly invite you. It's a good opportunity again to plug the uh, stories from the field section of the website. Uh, those are actually captured there um, where you can see where other federal agencies have been able to, to, to use our data. I mean, it's an important part of what we do is not just to, to, you know, to collect the data and put the information out the door, but really make sure that we're working collaboratively with our federal partners to make sure that, um, you know, collectively we're not duplicating efforts and wherever possible, uh, we can uh, we can make sure that we're uh, being as a, as complementary and, and effective there as, as we can. Good, yeah, and we have not just federal, um, but we, for instance, state. We work with, like, for example, the South Florida Climate Compact, working with them on a you know meta similar methodology for when they did their vulnerability assessment and. Um, and uh, yeah, there's a lot of examples. Um, I think this is uh, part of the mantra of, of map it once and use many times. <laughs> Let's not duplicate. We have the information and um, we, we'd like, we share it as much as we can. And I think there's a really good return on investment when it comes to um, using that for, for a lot of different purposes. And certainly a lot of the agencies have been doing that. Um, how far back does the title elevation data set go? So in the uh, graph that I showed you in our viewer right now, we only go back five years, and that's because co-ops is, um, we're actually accessing their data just like any public person could, and you can't get access beyond five years. We're changing that. Um, as I mentioned, we want to link better to their coastal inundation dashboard. They're going back as far as the record. Uh, each tide gauge has a different number of years, um, depending on when it came online, and they're doing the analysis, the threshold analysis, going as far back as it existed. So we want to pull in those graphs and go back much farther to tell a better story. It's five years of data, and I'm probably not statistically significant enough to show that there's a trend. Um, and of course, you know, in that analysis, it's not just high tide floods. They're all inundation that goes above those thresholds, whether it's surge or just tide, gets captured. Is there another app that does capture extreme events. Uh, thanks, Tracy. Yeah, um, so FEMA has a, a good, uh, their National Flood Hazard Layer, NHFL, which I always confuse with NA, NHL, <laughs> the National Hockey League. Um, the National Flood Hazard Layer is available through their geo portal. They have it as a map service um, that has all of their uh, digital flood insurance rate maps on there, and you can access that map service and pull it in as well. Um, I think a lot of folks end up 
doing that. Um, and I know there's other applications, for instance, on the West Coast, there's a, a something called the Cosmos model that USGS is running, and they're looking at the 1% the or the 100 year events and how sea level rise gonna, is gonna be uh, impact that. And, and so there's a more sophisticated analysis. Ours is really kind of an initial screening level. We don't get into the, the details and the modeling of, of uh, uh, the nuances of storm surge and, and how that's going to uh, change and, you know, the, the geomorphology changes. So, but there are definitely other tools out there that, that do that. Um, I think maybe that next question kind of, I just uh, was answering that, uh, maybe answers this one too. Um, in terms of the photo locations, yes, it's just a bathtub. We, we know the elevation at that location. For instance, I showed the customs house so we can kind of query what the elevation is there based on the LIDAR data that, that got, uh, got used for the DEM. And then we just kind of scale that up and, and it is a bathtub. So if it is changing the elevations really changed a lot around there, then it wouldn't accurately um, display that. So it's just sort of a, a ballpark way to show the impacts. All right, is it possible to change the zoom extent? Uh, whoops, oh, sorry, web map services for the West Coast to allow zoom. We're working on that. Yeah, the uh, even in the viewer, you can only zoom into a certain point and that's kind of controlled by the map services if you do pull those in. We've got a lot of requests to do that and it requires us to cache down to another level. We're using a cache service for a lot of that stuff um, for all, all the mapping layers. So we want to go in one more scale. So we want to go one to about one to 9,000. Um, and it's just going to take us a while to do that. So bear with us. <laughs> okay. And the last one there, the flood IQ shows sea level rise with storm flood. Yeah, that's a new tool that just came out. Um, uh, we're aware of that tool. It, just, it actually made a lot of press this week. Um, uh, we, we had talked in the past with, I think it's Matthew Ebley, I think, with uh, First Solutions about when they were first coming up with that tool, uh, we talked to them about some of the, the data sets that they're pulling in. They're all pretty much free available government um, data sets, including like the storm surge information from the slosh model. And um, so, uh, yeah, that is a tool that's out there pulling pulling that information in. Okay, we got a couple more questions. Oh, yeah, send more comments. Michael Flynn gave us a really good kudos, and then he's asking, we'd like to know if the 2016 uh, post-DEM has been applied post-Matthew. We have not updated, let me think. No, I don't think we've updated post-Matthew. We've updated the whole East Coast post-Sandy. Um, so that was done. I don't know if we've, in, I don't think we've gone back and updated post Matthew. Um, and let's see here. Okay, I think, yes, so yes, accretion affects model sea level rise. However, it seems this does not get translated over the changes in marsh habitat type. This might be a Nate question. And Nate's got another one coming too. So they're asking about the marsh migration. Uh, and Nate, can you read the questions so that everybody can hear what they are? Sure. So okay. this is a follow-up to one that was asked within the, within the chat. Um, but essentially what was being asked was that it, when you're in the marsh migration tab of the tool and you select uh, whatever is the most appropriate of the accretion rates that we have, you actually don't see any changes to the layers in the tool when you make that selection. What you end up seeing is changes to um, the essentially the various tick marks that are there beside the slider. So, you know, as you change between accretion or no accretion and a high level of accretion, you know, you'll see the years change in when you would expect uh, certain thresholds to be met. And so you won't actually see the changes until you move the slider manually to match those years. So if you wanted to see what the impact would be between um, accounting for accretion or not accounting for accretion, you'd have to go back and forth between selecting those two choices within the accretion pull down and then manually moving that 
uh, bubble on the slider back and forth between those. And, you know, some, some of those changes will have impacts in some areas and they won't have impacts in other areas. So it is included within the modeling, but the way that we set up the modeling, um, we do it in a fairly flexible way and you, and you kind of have to move that slider around to see what you really want to be able to see. So, you know, as you move that slider up and down, it'll always say three foot, but that three foot can mean uh, a lot of different things based on the scenario you've chosen and the amount of accretion rate. You need to use those, um, those tick marks and guideposts to help you make sure you're looking at the right thing. Hopefully that helped. Okay. And actually, I think the next question might be from Ingrid, might be for you too, Nate. Yeah, so I'm going to send, send a response and answer this one at the same time. So, um, yeah, we do have some pretty exciting new data sets that are coming out in the, the coming months to years for CCAP. Um, didn't really get into the data too much, but we have two main product lines, a 30-meter a data set that's, a, that's been produced for decades based off of Landsat imagery. That's most of what you see in the CONUS. And then we have a high-resolution product line. Um, typically something in the one meter to 2.4 meter resolution range for folks out in the Pacific, or if you're in the Land Cover Atlas, if you go to our data out in the Pacific, you'll see some of those, those data sets. Um, but we're actually trying to start a transition away from 30 meter products entirely, and we're trying to move towards one meter mapping products um, in the CONUS areas that we map. It's going to take us a long time or at least several years to do it, um, but we're going down that route right now. And some of the probably the first uh, data sets that we release tied to that will be some 10 meter derived products that we'll release later this summer. It won't be the full CCAP classification scheme, won't include our wetlands categories, but it'll be 10 meter land cover products uh, for most of those coastal areas I highlighted. In, within the land cover atlas. Okay, fantastic. I think we've answered all the questions that we have right now. If anybody can stop me if I'm wrong. Uh, I have to say this was a whole new model for answering questions and it was great. We took advantage of the new uh, webinar systems ability for all the panelists to see the questions to answer a ton of questions. So that was very exciting. Um, I liked it. <laughs> yeah, thank you everyone for, uh, thank you to all our attendees for being here. It was fabulous to have you on. And uh, thank you so much to our presenters, both for your presentations and for answering all the questions and so the ease of coordinating with you to get this done. We, we really enjoyed being able to host and we, there were a lot of people who were able to come learn more about the digital coast tools and so we're very excited about that. Uh, and thank you everyone. Um, there's been lots of requests for the recording and again that's that will be posted on openchannels.org uh, within the next few hours look under webinars and you'll be able to find the, the recording for this webinar because we've already had a bunch of people asking for it and a few people had to miss who wanted to catch up with it. So thank you everyone and have a great rest of your day wherever you are. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. All right. Thanks, Bye, everyone.